Tanya is the seminal work, it's the primary work of Chabad Hasidus. So to understand really what Tanya is all about, we have to understand what Hasidus is all about, and it's a little bit of history. So if you go back to, I actually wrote an article about it in the uh, Mosaic, that's why I have it here, so I'm going to dates. Late, uh, late 1600s, and then uh, through the, the late 1600s, and then later in the mid 1700s, there was the, the Shabtai Tzvi movement. And the movement began by Shabtai Tzvi, which declared himself a, a messiah, and he led many Jews astray. And then he was in the uh, late 1600s, and then in the 1700s, it was his successor, Jacob Frank, who claimed to be a uh, reincarnation or something like that of Shabtai Tzvi himself. And he took a lot of Jews, and there was a lot of uh, heresy that came along with that. And he was using language of Kabbalah. That's, the, that's one thing that happened at that time. So there was a spiritual um, threat, if you will, within the Jewish world. In addition to that, during this time, there's a lot of poverty and social distress. And Jews are not in a wealthy state. You know, today, relatively speaking, we're in a very wealthy state. But back then, um, Jews were not like that. So what ends up happening is, because of this, um, because of the social poverty and the spiritual threats, what ends up happening is, is the educated and the wealthy few start to insulate, right? Because there's all these threats from the outside. So what ends up happening is, when you when there's all these threats from the outside, you end up insulating more and more, right? You want to protect, you want to preserve Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, so you preserve it. You, you know, you, and uh, over time. The the insulation uh, led to led to a uh, to a culture where the educated few became very distant and very separate from the cult, the uneducated masses. So you had masses of Jews who were uneducated, uh, not wealthy, uninformed, and their Judaism constituted of nothing, right? Literally nothing. Like there was, there was no, they had, they had nothing. They had no education. They had nothing. And then there was the few who were in their ivory towers of scholarship, living in the big cities, and well, and with more access to, to wealth, whatever relative wealth existed then. And um, so, so, so this culture, this insulated culture, of scholars emerged, where where they so, so over time what happened is this culture started to look down at the masses of jews the jews in ma the, the mass of jews, uneducated jews were looked down upon and what was celebrated in these circles was scholarship and piety at least self-perceived piety and as time goes on and on this insulated group of self-proclaimed scholars and self uh congratulatory pie piety it, it, it ends up becoming like a competition almost right. and instead of your scholarship being a means to serve God your serving, <laughs> scholarship became a means to self-advancement and there was a certain it's almost in a way you know the, the Gemara says that if a person learns Torah if he merits his Torah is a potion of life and if he doesn't merit his Torah is a potion of, of death Sam Hamavis becomes a poison Torah itself becomes a poison how is that possible well, it depends how Torah is learned if Torah is learned with a sense of ego, with a sense of I want to prove myself, then Torah itself becomes the means to serve my ego, right. as opposed to my service of God becoming my source of humility. My Torah itself becomes the source of my my detriment, my own ego, and that's what happens in these cultures, where that's what happened at least then, where these scholarly elite who you know look down all these simple things that can't read Hebrew, God doesn't know me. I'm a pious man. Who who knows what God thinks about me? So in this climate, the Baal Shem Tov comes along and tells and goes from town to town, small towns, and starts preaching these, to these simple Jews that you know God loves you, you have a soul, and you're infinitely precious to Hashem, and the smallest thing you do is the most important, is the most precious thing in God's eyes. The, the Baal Shem Tov used to travel around and ask people, um, how are you? Why did he ask them how are you? Because he wanted them to say Baruch Hashem. Because when they say thank God, this gives God immeasurable pleasure. So you can imagine the way the scholars looked at this as a threat. Here they're preserving Judaism, and this Judaism is defined by scholarship and uh, and 
you know, how many hours you spend in the yeshiva and how many books you can publish. And here the Bashat comes and says, no, you know, God really loves a simple Jew who can't read Hebrew. And he says, thank God. Oh, now God is happy with that. This was a threatening version of Judaism, especially considering the fact that he was using language of Kabbalah and the memory of Shabbat Tzvi is fresh in their minds. And Shabbat Tzvi's movement, which led people astray, was using Kabbalistic language. So they looked at the whole Hasidic movement. This was where the opposition to the Hasidic movement came from. It wasn't unjustified. They thought this was going to be another heretical movement. He's rattling up the masses, convincing them about this uh, Kabbalistic language, telling them how amazing they are without, pro- without piety, without scholarship, telling simple Jews who can't read Hebrew that they're beloved by Hashem. This is very dangerous. You know, the quintessential Baal Shem Tov story, this is the most classic Baal Shem Tov story, is the Baal Shem Tov is about to start his prayer on Yom Kippur. And he's not, he's not starting his prayer. You ever heard the story before? You know the story when he's about to start his prayer, the Kukuriku story? I've heard it. Yeah, you have? And in, in brief, the story is that uh, he was about to start his prayer and he was hesitant and the students noticed he was hesitant and he was busy, his eyes and his face showed that he was in deep concentration so students realized that he was battling something in heaven so they joined in the prayers with him and nothing's working the Bashamta is not ready to start his prayer until this child this farm boy sitting in the back of the room who sees all the commotion and wants to join in and help them in the prayers but doesn't know any prayers so what does he scream he screams cock-a-doodle-doo because he knows that a copy of the sound of chicken because he's a farm boy and the Bashamta then turns around and says where do you start davening and he explains later that this child with a simple, pure cry of from the bottom of his heart screaming cock a doodle doo, this pierced the heavens. You know, imagine this. How ignorant a child had to be. To, he didn't even know one Hebrew sentence. Couldn't even call, scream out Shema, Maidani, Abracha, I don't know. Nothing. Cock a doodle doo. That's all he can say. He couldn't even, I don't know what language, Russian. He couldn't even say, I don't know, God, I love you in Russian or something. All they can do is a chicken sound. It's, and this is the Jew, the Bashem Tov says, this is the hero of the story. This is very threatening. You can imagine how threatening this is to an establishment that feels, you know it's going to tear down the, the uh, decrees in heaven? My scholarship. And the Bashem Tov says, no, me, I'm holy, I'm a scholar, true, maybe. But this guy broke the decree in heaven, screaming the chicken, sound of a chicken. Right? Now, after the Bashem Tov passes away, and this movement starts to gain traction, and he succeeded by the Magad Mezich. Now, by the time the Magad Mezich, the Bashamta's successor, becomes leader of the Hasidic movement, the Hasidic movement's followers also have scholars. Scholars who have seen the depth of the language of Kabbalah that the Bashamta was using, and likewise seeing past the false piety and, and, uh, and egotistic uh, scholarship, join the movement. So now the Magad sends his students around Europe to spread this message of Hasidus. And Hasidus, within the matter of three generations, Hasidus covers huge parts of Eastern Europe. Massive, their major success in a very short amount of time. But the students in the Magad faced a kind of dilemma. The whole point of the Bashem message was to teach and preserve this, this, pi- this simple, pure heart, the uncomplicated Jew who screams out, who says, thank God, you know, in the simplest terms, and this is the beautiful relationship that he's, that he's highlighting, the beautiful relationship with Hashem, or the kukuriku, the cockadoodle do. So, how do you uh, tell a scholar to get that feeling? Someone who's educated, who can read Hebrew. You're expecting him to scream cockadoodle do, Yom Kippur? That's crazy. Obviously not. So how do you preserve, or how do you teach this kind of this kind of uh, purity. You know, if you're born ignorant and you don't know any better and you really mean it with the, with the depth from the depth of your heart, okay, that's the Bashamta was talking to, simple Jews who didn't know any better and they meant it when they said it. But if I, as someone who has spent my entire life studying Torah, if I screamed cock a doodle doo, it, it, it wouldn't mean anything. It would be meaningless, right? Mm-hmm. So in a way, my, my uh, education ruins the sincerity I might have so the second and third generation of Hasidus had to deal with this. How do we preserve the Bashemta's teaching of sincerity of heart, quoting the Gemara, Rahman al God desires the heart. How do you preserve that sincerity and teach it? How do you teach the sincerity? 
So here is where the Alter Rebbe Chabad deferred from the rest of the Hasidic branches. The Maggid students who I said they traveled all around Europe to teach Hasidus, they basically became the different dynasties. The different dynasties you have in Hasidus, you know, Visions, Bells, Square, Ger, all these different dynasties, they all trace back teacher, teacher, teacher back to one of the students of the Maggid in some town and then to the Maggid and then to Baal Shem Tov, right? So the Chabad movement within that deferred from the rest of them in addressing this issue. How do you preserve the Baal Shem Tov's methodology and how do you teach the purity of heart? So the other Hasidic movements said like this, what you need is to get all Jews to get to the point where they appreciate the truth of Hashem to the point that this that they develop their own sincerity of heart, you can't do that. You can't expect that from the masses of Jews. What we could do is, you set up in every town or in every location, one Jew who does feel that sincerity, who does feel that connection, we'll call him a Rebbe. And then the community who hangs, who hangs around him, they hear his words of Torah that he says with sincerity. They hear his prayer that he says with sincerity. They hear him sing a song with sincerity and that'll rub off on them. So even if, Everybody doesn't scream cock a doodle doo on their own, but they can get some of that by vicariously or through their connection to the Rebbe who does feel it. That's what most Hasidus is modeled on, most of Hasidic groups. Following? With me? Now, the Alter Rebbe Chabad Hasidus changes a little bit, had a different attitude. And his attitude was we are going to make a system in which. Jews can develop their own relationship to Hashem so that they have that sincerity. Now, how is that? And this is where the word Chabad comes from. The word Chabad in Hebrew is Ches Beis Dalad. It stands for Chachma Bina Das, wisdom, understanding, knowledge. It's the three properties of, of intellect, as we'll, as we'll learn in, in the book itself. So by using one's mind, to understand as much as one can of what the soul is all about, what God is all about, what God wants in His Torah and Mitzvahs, I can come through developing in my own mind a relationship with Hashem, I can come to that sincerity. I'll give you an example. When you say, Blessed are you, God, our Lord, in a bracha, a child says the bracha, what does a child mean? It's uncomplicated. Blessed are you, God, our Lord. You don't need any explanations. Right? But then, or you know, best of you got a Lord, master of the universe. Then you get older as an adult, master of the universe. I'm not the master of myself. And you, blessed are you, blessed are, are you, Lord our God. What is Lord God? What does it mean? What's a God? What's a Lord? Who are you? It's, it's, it's the mind that ruins all of this, right? So one answer is, okay, you know, put your mind aside for a second. Go dance by a, by a Hasidic gathering. You'll feel it, and then it'll all be okay. The Chabad method is, Let's explore those questions. What is God? What does it mean, God, God our Lord? What does it mean, blessed are you, God our Lord? What does it mean that God's master of the universe? And then when you slowly develop an understanding of, of, of God being the essence of existence and how he brings you into being every moment and you can understand what these words mean, blessed are you, God our Lord, now you can say it with a true sincerity. So every person might experience it differently based on their level of understanding and based on their level of development but you can still develop it on your own. Now, however radical the Baal Shem Tov's message is that the simple Jew with a simple blessing, blessed are you God our Lord, is the most precious thing to God, if that was radical, then the notion that every Jew can develop his own relationship with Hashem based on his logic of understanding what God is, that's even more radical. So the opposition that there was to the Hasidic movement from the Baal Shem Tov doubled down on the Alter Rebbe. This is, now you understand why there was such strong opposition to the Alter Rebbe. They thought it was dangerous. You, you want to teach masses about the nature of God and the nature of the soul? This is a dangerous idea. What happens if they get it wrong? This was a very dangerous idea. And this is, and this is what Tanya is. Tanya is where he lays out how a person can develop his own personal relationship with Hashem. And primarily speaking, there's five parts of Tanya, but primarily speaking, there are two parts of the Tanya. Part two of Tanya is a description of how God creates. So it's how God relates to, the real, to our reality. And part one is the description of the soul, the soul struggle, and how the soul can develop its relationship with Hashem. So the first half of Tanya is from below to above, if you will, from man to God. And the second half of Tanya, second, part two of Tanya, is from God to man. Are we clear? 
Okay, so with that, now we understand why Tanya is so central to Hasidus, to Chabad, and why it's learned again and again and again and again, because really in this is where the Chassid finds and develops his relationship with Hashem, which is what we're all really after.